performance is literally that. It's to inform you about something that's going to happen. Um, on my left is my good friend Charles Brown, who's our composer in residence. If you were here um, a year ago Christmas, we did his concerto, Christmas concerto for uh, Hammer Dulcimer, which he plays brilliantly. Some people remembered you, yes. It was an amazing night, really, really, for Hammer Dulcimer Strings and Percussion. And on my right is Charles' um, brother, Don. I know who you are. I'm just <laughs> thinking of something sassy to say about you, but I don't have anything because you're a very nice person who's from out of town and uh, wrote uh, most of the, if not all of the, script for this piece. Uh, composer in residence means that we have a relationship with uh, someone whose livelihood is to write music, and that's Charles. It's not all he does with his life, but we're not going to talk about that tonight. I met Charles a few years ago at Moody um, Church, and uh, he was playing the Hammer Dulcimer on stage at Moody in worship, and I thought, what is this? You know, it was just so, as a former worshiper, I was a worship leader myself, I thought, wow, this is just the coolest thing. We became friends. He eventually played percussion with us a couple times, and then I said, how would you like to play those Christmas pieces on a on a um, Lake County Symphony Orchestra program. And then he came to me and we met at Jay Alexander's. He said, I want to meet you for lunch. And I thought, oh, he's going to back out. But instead, he had this amazing proposal to write music for us for four seasons and become our composer in residence. And uh, I took it to the board of the orchestra and we all agreed. And it's uh, so far been a really wonderful thing. So that means that that person each year writes something. And and every composer in residence and artistic director's relationship is slightly different. Sometimes people just write things on their own and they give them to the orchestra. Charles is, really wants to be collegial, so we talk about what he's going to write. Um, tonight is um, something that's incredibly near and dear to our minds and hearts, as you'll find out. So, um, Charles, before we talk about poem, um, tell me, tell the audience um, what it's like to be a composer in residence in... Your own words. Sure. Um, it's great to have a full symphony orchestra at your disposal. There's nobody that can argue with that for a moment. So it's an, indeed a huge privilege to have that. As a composer, I have a choice of a lot of different compositional forms. I could write um, an overture like you heard tonight with Beethoven. I could write a concerto for tuba or violin or flute. I could write an opera. I could write a requiem. But I decided that using the symphonic tone poem might be really interesting this time. Franz Liszt started this uh, form with his very famous Le Prelude. And the reason I like this is because it's not just music for music's sake. It's music with an agenda to address something that's happening currently in society. Now, it can be done with words, it can be done just with the music, we chose, um, Don and I, to use not only a singer, but a narrator. And that was the premise of how we got started. Because I don't really write lyrics, I had three words that I gave to my brother. I said, I have these words that have been sort of haunting me for you know, the better part of 2019. America, a miracle. America, a miracle. This country was founded on a knife's edge, had... Washington's army not been just precisely on time, we might be speaking a different language today. We might not be here. And the same thing happened in the Civil War. We've existed on a knife's edge. And I wanted to communicate to our audience with music just how important and how cherished that is. Very good. So, Don, um, tell us a little bit about where you come in, and then I have some things to say about the poem. Well, Charlie came to me with this idea of a, of a tone poem. We want to talk about acrimonious political diatribe in America. So, boy, how do we do that and stay in the middle of things? And as I started putting this together, I thought, you know, I can say what I think or I can say what I think they might want to hear, but let's do this. Let's go back to our founding fathers and to great American patriots and to great American leaders, both Democrat and Republican, and see what they had to say. So if you look in your program, you'll hear, you're going to hear words tonight from 
Patrick Henry from Benjamin Franklin <clears throat> in, in the sixth movement, you're going to hear interwoven into the same sentence and paragraph words spoken essentially from the bully pulpit from Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy, both men of opposite parties that were elected 100 years apart from one another and that were both assassinated for their effort. So what we're trying to say here is, is it possible for people of different political backgrounds and different, vastly different points of view to come together and have a cordiality of conversation in discussing our viewpoints. And we say, yes, there is. So it's not unusual that a composer would have an agenda. Um, some, uh, not all the wonderful music that you hear from Beethoven and Brahms and Tchaikovsky and Stravinsky and Bach and uh, very, very famous composers that would just roll off your lips even though you don't know much about music. There was, there's controversy swirling around many of those people. There's a very famous Russian composer that eventually moved to America named Igor Stravinsky who wrote a ballet called The Rite of Spring at which first performance saw fruit and vegetables being thrown from the audience to the stage because they had never heard anything so um, harmonically and rhythmically discordant. That work is iconic now in classical music and it is a magnificent work. Um, Charles and I were talking about um, Brahms, which symphony? Uh, one of the symphonies where the conductor, first conducting it, walked off stage, he thought the music was so horrible. So, Charles doesn't have that kind of agenda. Shostakovich, another Russian composer, was thrown out of his country because even though he really didn't say anything in the score about an agenda that he had, the Russian government, the communist government, knew that Shostakovich was making a very vivid statement about what was happening culturally, spiritually, and politically in Russia through his music. So, I, as a conductor, love this collegial thing that we have going on. Next year it's going to be a requiem uh, around this time with chorus and orchestra and possibly soloists and then po uh, probably a concerto the fourth year. But I like it because, and I especially like being part of the process because I share, Charles and I share our desire for us to be able to be humane toward each other even though we don't agree. I grew up in a house with a Republican father and a Democratic mother and I never heard my parents hurl insults or acrimony to, at each other the whole time I lived there, not once. Well, the phrase goes, we've come a long way, baby. We've taken the gloves off and we, we need to learn how to respect each other. So the poem is this vivid, raucous, poignant, breathing, living organism that talks about where we are and the possibility of how we could live a different life. As wonderful as Don's words are, if a composer could say everything that he needed to say using words, he wouldn't bother trying to do it using music. He would just use the words. But I had more to say than just words. This piece was conceived in six movements, the first of which actually starts with America the Beautiful. You're probably gonna start listening and go, well, this sounds fine to me. But by the second verse, it goes very wrong and ends quietly as in, now what's gonna happen? Well, what happens is the second movement. And many of the orchestral members, including myself, have lost a great deal of hair, you can see, <laughs> not only writing and performing this piece, but just dealing with the tension and the dissonance in it. So I'd like you to try to imagine, when you hear the second movement, that out here somewhere is Donald Trump talking nonstop. That's probably tough for you to imagine, but imagine <laughs> nonstop. And back here is Nancy Pelosi. Over here is Chuck Schumer. And over here is, I don't know, Mitch McConnell, Rand Paul, just pick a guy or a gal. And it doesn't stop. 
It never stops for five minutes and it gets faster and more feverish and more acrimonious. So if by the end of the second movement you are feeling fidgety and uncomfortable, hang in there. The we did our job. We did our job. The third movement, um, Melanie is going to sing to us and ask a question and make some statements and ask another question. And this is where we just have time to reflect on, is this really what we want, what we just heard in two? To give a pause from that, as we move into movement four, we call on the words that Don researched from Harry Truman, a Democrat, who had some pretty strong, tough things to say to all of us. You will be shocked. And it would be great if we could just transition into the sixth heroic movement, but then I would be omitting what? I would be omitting the press. <laughs> so the fifth and very difficult harmonic movement, again, you see the hairs that have been <laughs> lost, not just mine, but the players. Imagine Rush Limbaugh, okay? Back here, we have Wolf Blitzer. Mm -hmm. Up here, Sean Hannity. Back here, I don't know, Chris Matthews, whoever, and it never stops. And the pitch gets louder and louder and stronger and nobody's listening and it's just dissonance that never ends. And that's the fifth movement. But hang in there. The sixth movement talks about hope, talks about possibility, just what my brother said. And we think that you'll leave here, we hope, a changed person for that. <laughs> 